Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 231. Don't worry about failures. Worry about the chances you miss when you don't even try. Jack Canfield. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, Indie Film Hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am, yeah, I'm a host, Alex Ferrari. Today's episode is brought to you by Blackbox. Blackbox is a new platform and community that is all about financial freedom for filmmakers like you. If you join Blackbox, you will be transformed from being a worker to being a maker of your own content. And you'll be making steady passive income from the global market. Blackbox currently allows you to upload your stock footage once, get it to many global agencies, and then allows you to share that passive income stream with your collaborators. Whether you want to submit old footage that's been sitting around in your hard drives or create brand new content, Blackbox is for you. It's really quite revolutionary. With Blackbox, filmmakers can concentrate on making great content while Blackbox takes care of all the business BS. Just visit www.blackbox.global to find out more. Today's show is also sponsored by Studio Unknown. Studio Known is a crack team of audio post professionals known for quality sound on any indie budget. Whether you need a lush surround sound mix or a quick festival submission pass, Studio Known can help you with all of your post sound needs, from sound design and mix to Foley, ADR, and even a custom score. Contact Studio Known and mention the Indie Film Hustle podcast, and you'll get 50% off one day of ADR or 10% off your complete post sound package. Just go to studiounknown.com. So before we get started today, I wanted to let you know that today is the day we have released the Indie Film Producing Masterclass with Suzanne Lyons. Now, a bunch of you got early access and the reviews are in and people are loving it. It is close to six hours of how to produce a feature film for a million dollar budget and below. But you can use all of these techniques and skills on bigger budget films as well. So if you guys want to check out what everyone's talking about, just head over to producingmasterclass.com. And I'm going to be honest with you, it's probably the best course that I've ever produced for the tribe. It is a must take. So if you guys love what I do and, and really appreciate all the work that I do on the podcast and all the free content I give you, please support and go to take this course. And I promise you, you will not be disappointed. And there's a 30-day money-back guarantee, of course. So just head over to producingmasterclass.com. Now, today's guest is Kia Kiso. She is a producer of a wildly successful documentary called A Mile, Mile and a Half. And what I found so amazing about her success is how she was able to use crowdsourcing to be able to generate Uh, not only revenue, but interest and sponsorships and money coming in from all over the place, attention coming from all over the place. So her and the team behind the movie really did an amazing job. And the more and more I studied about it, the more and more impressed I was. So I wanted to bring Kia onto the show to just give us all of her secrets on how she was able to engage and identify this audience. And if you listen to last week's episode with R.B. Bato about the crowdsourcing for filmmakers, this is a perfect companion episode. And if you've not heard that episode, definitely go check that out now. That one's an epic episode. R.B. and I go at it as we usually do. With so much great information, but that's a perfect companion to this episode. So get ready to take some notes and get inspired. Enjoy my conversation with Kia Kiso. I'd like to welcome to the show Kia Kiso. How are you doing, my dear? I'm doing great, Alex. Thanks uh, for having me. Oh, thank you for doing the show. I uh, We bumped into each other at AFM, and yes. uh, I heard your story of all the amazing things you're doing out in the world, and I thought you would be an amazing guest to have on the show. So uh, I, I really appreciate you taking the time out to talk to the tribe. I appreciate it. I'm a huge fan of the show, so I'm glad to uh, share what I've learned. Hopefully, people can take it and run with it and improve on it, and then we can hear their stories. Absolutely. So, how first of all, how did you get into the business? I actually took a gifted and talented summer course when I was 12 years old at a local community college, and it was a three-camera TV production class. I hate you. I hate you already. Uh, 
I know. <laughs> and um, I, I, you know, the bug, I got bit by the bug and I immediately realized like, I was like, oh my gosh, I can tell stories. I can help, you know, entertain the world. I never really realized it was a job before then. So sure. that was the focus. Went to uh, a really cool film school in Santa Fe, New Mexico, nice. where, which is actually where I met Rick Serena from Mile, Mile and a Half. Mm-hmm. And uh, because we were good college buddies. And then I moved out here after graduation. Well, after a brief stint on a on a movie in Colorado and uh, been out in L.A. ever since. And um, I've had an interesting career trajectory. I've changed jobs a couple times. And you've uh, done everything. You've done everything. You were you've been (laughs) you you're you've you're a lot of hyphens, a lot of hyphens in in your biography. Uh, So you were a colorist at one point as well, right? I was a colorist. I was also a camera assistant and a loader for 12 years as well. A loader and loading that thing called film, I hear. I know. <laughs> I know. It's actually funny. I was pulled out of retirement maybe seven years ago because a friend of mine called and he was like, I know you don't do this anymore, but I can't find anybody to load film for this Carl Jr. commercial. And will you please come load film? And I was like, oh, okay, I don't mind. And actually, that's where I met my husband. So it was a good <laughs> it was a win-win. <laughs> it worked out well then. Yes. Um, so let's talk about Mile, Mile and a Half. It's an amazing documentary that you did. You. And uh, the the story on how it came to be, how you funded it, how you marketed it, how you sold it, how you got it on different platforms, it's a fascinating story. And it's actually a case study in uh, our our mutual friend RB's uh, book, uh, how to, is it called? I forgot. It's crowd crowdsourcing. What's the exact title of this book? I forgot. Crowdsourcing power of the people. I'm not, a, it's a, it's a long title. It's, it's amazing. It is a very amazing book. And we're going to have him on the show to oh, talk about that. I have it right so. here. Richard Botto crowdsourcing for filmmakers, indie film and the power of the crowd. There you go. So, and you are in that book as well. So tell yes, me a little bit about mile and a half. How did you start from the beginning to, you know, how did you get this crowd? How did you get them fun, funding for it in the first place? Exactly. So it was never funded in the beginning. Okay. It was, you know, the, the film itself to explain for people that haven't seen it before. It's a feature documentary. It's about a group of filmmaker friends that decided to hike the John Muir Trail in California. It's, sh- and it's a short trail, short trail. Yeah, it's over 200, what, like 219 11, miles. Something like that. 211. Yeah. yeah. And um, they decided to take their film gear with them along the way there, you know, even Rick carried a slider with him for God's sake. (laughs) So, um, they had originally asked if I wanted to be on the trail. I said, Oh hell no. (laughs) And, um, I actually went diving in the great barrier reef instead. They had a great time and, uh, I dropped them off on the trail and how long was, how long was the actual trip? 20 something days for them. Jeez, God bless you. Sure. And then, and then I say I drop them off at the trail, and I pick them up during distribution. <laughs> so after they came back, then they realized that they had um, some fun footage, and they put together a short music video. Uh, the filmmakers were Rick Serena, Jen Serena, Jason Fitzpatrick, Drand Trench, and Z Hatley. Those were the main hikers. Mm-hmm. Sometimes people would drop in and hike with them for a little bit. Um, the musicians, for example, would also so went in two. So what they did is they said, let's take some of this footage, put it together with uh, one of the songs from uh, PB, Paul Be- Bessenbacher, and um, and let's make a video. So they made a video, put it up on Facebook, shared it with friends and family, and it kind of had this viral moment. People really loved it, especially the hiking community. Um, it was a fun song. And while they, <laughs> of course, everybody was surprised how uh, much interest there was. The filmmakers were surprised how much interest there was in the music video. And uh, very smartly, they took note of all the bloggers and the individuals and the companies that were sharing it. And we Mm -hmm. used that information later. And so they sent out the music video, really smart way to do it. And to talk about funding briefly, they just paid for the hike out of their own pockets and they had their own gear anyway. And uh, they were like, if something can come out of this, great. And they looked at the footage and they realized that there's a cool story. Almost the story of them doing the hike was the fun story. And they decided to do the feature doc, but they said, if, and we put together a budget, uh, $78,100 mm-hmm. to do the feature. And we're like, okay, if we don't raise the money in that, 
with a crowdfunding campaign, then we won't, don't do the film. So it was a, it was a very compelling call to action to uh, put out in a crowdfunding campaign saying, if you loved the, the music, video. music video, then you want to see a film of this, support it and make it happen. Because if you don't support it, it's not going to happen. That's Period. like a pretty good, a pretty good call to action. Like yeah. if you if you like the appetizer and you want the meal, then you better pay for it. Got it. Right. And support it and really be behind it. Um, so they spent the team spent a lot of time putting together a really detailed crowdfunding campaign. I liken it to almost being in pre-production. Mm-hmm. And um, they scheduled out. This is what we're, you know, the campaign is going to be X amount of days long. Based on statistics of winning campaigns, you need to do a new post, a new video every three days. You need to have regular posts and whatever. And they built the content ahead of time. Because once a campaign's going, you're going to be nonstop just running, managing the campaign. You don't have time to create new content, make a new blog, make a new video. So do it all ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And they divided up, they divided up all the tasks uh, amongst them. It's easy to do if you have a team. Sure. It's hard to do if it's just you. So then they launched the campaign and that's when our crowdsourcing really began. And now can you define crowdsourcing for everybody listening? Yeah. Everybody knows the word crowdfunding, right? Mm -hmm. That's Mm -hmm. sort of something from a crowd. And people think the word crowdsourcing is synonymous and it's not. Mm -hmm. It's leveraging your crowd, leveraging your fan base in order to create more success behind whatever your endeavor is. Mm-hmm. RB used it for stage 32. He crowdsourced stage 32. We used it for my mile and a half. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and that's where I really jumped in. And um, we, we first of all identified who our crowd was because you have to know you can't serve everybody. Right. And I think we gave, we came up with a list of over 30 people that could potentially be interested in this film as an audience. And then we selected three, maybe mm-hmm. you can't do more than three. You know, we didn't go for like the, hmm, the active senior, right? So we, okay. So let's just, uh, let's take it back for a yeah. second. The 30 people that you said you like basically creating 30 avatars of people mm-hmm. that would be interested. profiles. Got you. That's what, yeah. So everybody in the audience understands what that means. And right. then out of those 30 people, they're like, these people could possibly like the movie, but these are the three that we're going to focus all our energy on. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, the cubicle rat, somebody that's, you know, stuck in a desk job. The majority of the time they just need an escape. Or like I said, the active senior, they could potentially be interested. And we have found that they are, but we went over sort of what we thought was the largest market and one that we understood the most. Mm -hmm. Right. So we went for people that like documentaries, people that like the arts, people that love high gain. Mm -hmm. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Exactly. And, exactly. and and the hiking community is is a niche, but it's a fairly large and lucrative niche. Yes, exactly. And that's what I really love about this kind of filmmaking and marketing distribution is instead of going wide for quadrant, go down, drill deep. Mm-hmm. Right? Narrow and, and deep is could also be extremely lucrative. I wonder if the future of the film business is. One is just gonna be like I make content for women that love chocolate and have poodles, right? Well, and I, they pay me, <laughs> right? But that's basically YouTube at this point. Like you've got people opening mm-hmm. up toys and they've got mm-hmm. 10 million yep. followers. Like right. That's, right, right. that's ridiculous. And they're not doing <laughs> toys for all four quadrants, right? They're doing people that like this Disney, particular Disney of- toys and, yes, exactly. and a Pokemon and my little pony. And she's sitting yep. there going, when I saw that, I was like, uh, is the yep. world coming to an end? Are we... Right. <laughs> the world cup. No, it's people identifying their audience and really leveraging in them and serving them. Exactly. And so that's what we wanted to do. And that's part of what crowdsourcing is, right? You find where the apex is, the combination of what you're creating and the people that want to serve it. Because you only need a certain sort of um, number of evangelists, so mm-hmm. to speak, that are then going to open you up to their worlds as well. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, people were hungry for a hiking documentary, right? right. So – you're providing that need. You're not, you know, some salesman out there saying, buy my stuff. You know, you're providing something that people want and they just need to know where to find it. And then mm-hmm. boom, you show up. So, uh, and, so I do, our, and I do mm-hmm. think, uh, by the way, I do think the future of independent film is going to be much more compartmentalized and more niche. And the yeah. riches will be in the niches because you, we can't, as independent filmmakers, just go broad. We can't afford it. We can't. No. 
we we can't. I think it is going to be the future of, but it, I think in many ways it's already here. I mean, look at all. There's what 450, 500 scripted shows. Sure. Now and before there was like you know forty. <laughs> well, maybe that's the answer to peak TV too. Is you don't create a TV show for everybody. You create right. a TV show for your your niche. Right. You know, I hear and it's and it's an urban legend, and I've heard bits and pieces of it being true. But I love to continue to support like and spread the myth. <laughs> Go for it. Is that there's a filmmaker and he makes films for firefighters. And he goes around, the content is about firefighting. They're usually dramatic narrative feature films, excuse Mm -hmm. me. And he goes around, he travels around and he shows them at firehouses. Like, you know, he should, because these firemen are just sitting around anyway, right? On their long shifts. He sells tickets for them and he nets a million a year. I want somebody to just prove it or prove it. But I, but what I love is that idea of like, you can be very lucrative with going niche and mile, mile and a half, you know, we're, we're going to hit profits early, That's earlier which is than insa- our projections. Which is insane, which is insane. Yeah. But by the way, I am now going to, uh, to spread that myth as well. Perfect. <laughs> and just keep I'm the going. firefighter filmmaker. <laughs> the firefighter filmmaker <laughs> is such, I know, right? It's such an amazing idea. And he, mm-hmm. he, but it's a work, it's work, but this is a full-time job. He just goes. Well, and he, yeah. And you know, we can bet in our myth that this guy loves firefighting. I would imagine, or he right. was a firefighter or something. Like right. That. Exactly. Just like with my, my half, these are hikers. We love hikers. That's why we picked the psychographic of hikers mm-hmm. is because there are people, we know where they shop. We know what inst or what social media platform they on. They're on. We know how much money they spend. We know what they like, you know, what swag do they like? Like we understand them. Cause you have to know all of that. When you come up with, these are my, this is my target audience. You have to imagine who are these people? Where are they shopping? Who do I want to align with? What blogs are they reading? Mm-hmm. Right? All this matters. So then how did you so how how did the Kickstarter campaign go off when you when you actually how much did you raise? Sure. How long, yeah, all that story. Sure. Yeah. So it was it was a longer campaign. I believe it was 60 days because we want to really give ourselves a lot of time to go and reach out. And we had created a list. We had an intern come up with a list of the top bloggers for hiking. Mm -hmm. And then we reached out, created those relationships with those bloggers and continued to serve that relationship over time. We would give them maybe exclusives. Hey, do you want to have an exclusive inner with you with one of our hikers? Or do you want some of this content? We will create a we've created a special, you know, second version of the trailer and we are going to only release it with this particular blogger. Right. That's so smart. <laughs> so try to be super smart because we were just trying to build the audience, trying mm-hmm. to build that. And, um, we ended up raising 85,500. That's, that's awesome. Right. So we definitely got over our goal mm-hmm. and it felt touch and go. And, you know, I could talk just about crowdfunding and I know Ugh. that we don't want to a lot on there. But, you know, we had a strategy based on these are the numbers we hit need to hit on this particular day. Mm -hmm. And we knew that we needed to show movement. So we had people standing by that said, I want to donate, but I want to donate at the right time. And so we'd say, okay, can you wait till day 15? If there's not movement, then you can jump in there. Mm -hmm. And but then if there was movement, then we'd say, okay, we want to push you to day 20. You know, so we all smart. I'm sorry. It's just so rare to, to hear smart. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's not, you don't just put it up there and cross your fingers. It's, it's marketing. It's, you've got to think as a filmmaker, you've got to think of what does my audience want? Another thing that's important too, that I want to mention is that in our social media campaign, we did, uh, what I called, I don't know if the team would call it deposit, deposit, deposit withdrawal. So we would do three posts that were for the fans right? Like what's your favorite meal on the trail? Send us your favorite photo of your last hike. Here's an article about the latest hiking boot that's out there. And then the fourth post would be like, Hey, something about the film, something about the campaign. So our social media feeds felt like they were sponsored by the movie, so to speak, but really we wanted to be sort of the hub of conversation about hiking. So people felt like it was a place to go. They kept wanting to return. And every once in a while I would say, Hey, don't forget about the campaign. Okay. Or would say, Hey, can you do something? Right. Mm -hmm. Can you do something? So we, we started that conversation really early. So the way I was able to snowball 
getting Mile My on Half on Netflix because of our crowd Mm -hmm. started really then after the crowdfunding campaign. Really? Because, yes. So, because my goal was to get us distribution, Mm -hmm. right? To start to get us some money back. And I was able then to say, look, we've raised over our goal and we had 800 backers we're something for you to pay attention to. So I began sending out the trailer and just some stats about our fans to potential sales agents Mm -hmm. and distributors. Mm -hmm. So we started getting interest in it that way. People like, yeah, show me the trailer. I would be interested in knowing more. Or I'd simply say, hey, we're still in the editing phase. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend here? I love to bring in my distributors and my marketers, even in pre-production if I can, Mm -hmm. because they know what the market wants. Of course. And so we had a distributor say, we see you have something in here, just a little bit about a Japanese hiker. Can you make that bigger? Because we'll probably be able to engage an Asian audience then. Mm-hmm. So we, pu- we buffed up that role a little bit in the film. So I was able then to take this interest from distributors and reach out to other sales agents and distributors and say, hey, look at the people that are looking at the film, mm-hmm. plus look at how many fans we have. And look, we now have 4,000 people on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Are you interested in watching the trailer? Are you interested in coming aboard? So before we even did our premiere, we already had people sniffing around. We had distributors and sales agents sniffing around. And um, then we had to think of the premiere. I'm just giving you the snowball, right? I'm sure, showing sure, you how the sure. people eventually became Netflix mm-hmm. and eventually became profits. Sure. So then we knew we wanted to do a premiere. We had started a relationship with the American Hiking Society. They were our fiscal sponsor. Mm-hmm. And also they had like a million members. So they were starting to put information about the film in their newsletter. And we knew that we wanted to premiere on June 1st, because that's National Hiking Day. (laughs) And it would also give the American Hiking Society, you know, a fun way to also engage with the film. And, you know, just instead of saying, hey, watch this film, say, hey, on American Hiking Day, uh, National Hiking Day, go on a hike, then watch the movie. And we, because we knew we wanted to premiere that day, and we were going to keep it like a tight knit screening that wouldn't impact our ability to go to film festivals. Mm -hmm. We just started looking at where can we for a wall of space uh, to just do our own premiere. And we were looking at Golden Road Brewery here in in LA and because they were a part sponsor as well. Um, But because I had reached out to a couple film festivals in LA, uh, we had submitted there early. I got back to them and I said, look, it was dances with films that I really pushed on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. And they contacted me and they're like, that was brilliant. We really loved it. Will you teach this to other people? So uh, I said, look, we're going to premiere on June 1st. Would love it to do it with you guys. And as a matter of fact, we've had a Kickstarter campaign that we did a year ago. It had been pretty much a year. It took us a year to get through all of the posts for the film. And we were continuing to engage with our fan base. So they were eager to see the movie. And I told Dance with the Film, look, we know we have X amount of fans in L.A. They're going to come to our premiere. We know we're going to have a full room. We'd love to premiere with you, but we're happy to do a four wall at the Golden Root Brewery. And they were like, but we don't make decisions until, you know, later on in a date. I was like, it's well, but I need to know now. <laughs> and so they were able to squeeze things a little bit and let us know that they approved us being in the film festival. I was able to sort of tip their hand in my favor because I already had an audience that I could prove, right? Sure. So the minute tickets went on sale, we sold out in four days. Right. Our screening and Dances with Films is like, what's going on? I can't believe it. You were not joking. I was like, no, I wasn't joking because our, <laughs> our poor fans, they were so eager right. to see the film. Sure. And so they added a second screening. An exact, I said, can we add a second theater? At the exact same time, so audiences are watching simultaneously and we can bring more people. Because mm-hmm. I know a lot of people didn't get tickets. They agreed. So now, all of a sudden, we have a venue mm-hmm. and we have a film festival, so we have some laurels. We had the screening at the film festival. Of course, because our audience was so big, guess what? We got the audience award. <laughs> of course. And, and also, as a side note, people loved the film so much, they were willing to wait for 45 minutes in the lobby to buy the DVDs that we had made. 
So then we were able to actually generate that into some income and swag, right? We had buffs, we had t-shirts, we had stickers and stuff like that. Merch. So, but at the, at the award show where we got the audience award, guess who's in the audience? Gravitas. Of course. The VP of acquisitions was Mm -hmm. there. Hey, I love to film. Oh my God, you just got this award. I'm like, yeah, all of our fans are going to be so excited. We have so many fans. (laughs) (laughs) I laid it on thick and they were like, we want to see the movie. Of course you did. So they sent the movie and guess what? They sent over a proposal. They wanted to work with us. Uh So you got distribution through them? We did. And I did my due diligence. I asked around. I talked to other filmmakers who'd work with them too. And I heard that they weren't like the sweaty guy with the gold chains that was going to hit it hard and be like, hey, baby, I love you. And the minute you come, they're like gone. So 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 not Harvey Weinstein. Got it. (laughs) (laughs) Not Harvey Weinstein. Oh, my God. Yeah, him and his lot. So so then we were able to get distribution. And then because I was able to get – they wanted domestic VOD. And then I was able to use that as leverage to then get international VOD with somebody else. Mm -hmm. And who did you go with international VOD with? We had a sales agent. um, Oh, my God. Of course, her name just totally blanked. She's going to kill me. Uh, But you had a sales agent. um, Oh, film option. Okay. Um, And so she handled all the international rights. Mm -hmm. And then – we bar we bifurcated our rights. We didn't give everything to one person. Right. So we did DVD through Passion River, mm-hmm. and we gave them sort of a special edition DVD. But we kept more. Uh, no, we gave them the bare bones DVD. We kept the special edition one, so we could sell in person. As we get, we began to four wall around mm-hmm. the country, mm-hmm. and as we began to do our theatrical uh, on demand through Tug. Okay, so let's so so let's take it back a little bit because there's a lot of stuff going on. So mm-hmm. you had you had your dances with wolves, uh, dances with wolves, dances with films uh, premiere. Uh, yep. You're selling T-shirts and DVDs in the in the lobby. Yes. Uh, after that, you got a distribution deal through Gravitas. So you did not do any self distribution at all. We did. We fought hard to keep the right to sell the film from our website. Which is fine. Which is fine. So that's a- and and that was a hard hard to do. And uh, I don't know if they would do it anymore. So we used VHX to put it on our website. How was, how was your VHX experience? I love them. I've used them for, I also use them for inspired to ride Mm -hmm. and uh, they're gems. They actually were able to rewrite some code for us. So it was able to do what we needed it to do. So with, with VHX is what I found is they're a great platform. Um, I've been talking about them since I, I started the podcast. Um, the problem with VHX I find is that if you don't have an audience, uh, it's, it's useless because they don't have a web. Yeah, they, no one's going to find you on VHX unless you drive the traffic to them. Is that a fair statement? Quite honestly, and I'm going to be a hard ass about it. It's your job to yes. drive audience to yes. your, it's like, it's like yes. you build you build your business and you put it out near Lancaster. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, you might have a great business, but nobody's going to know it's there. Mm-hmm. You have to let people know they have to drive out to Lancaster to see your, you know, to mm-hmm. come buy something there. Right. Nobody, exactly. nobody, nobody is going to drive traffic, even if it's on Gravitas, even if it's on Netflix, even if it's in the movie theater down the road. Nobody's going to give a. Nobody's going to care. <laughs> <laughs> driving traffic to you. And, and we can talk about that when I talk about the release on iTunes and how I was able to leverage the audience to be on iTunes. Like it's Gravitas was like, so surprised that we actually had as big of a launch as we did. They didn't bring anything to the table. So I think filmmakers should just be super clear. Nobody's doing anything for you. And so then again, I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to be the devil's advocate here. Why go with a gravitas when you could have easily self distributed gotten on the souls platforms yourself like a distributor or something like that well like a distributor or go yeah go through it yourself because you have the audience so basically you're you could have made more money because you're driving all the traffic so if, to these platforms so unless they're not really bringing anything to the table what was the benefit of using a, dis- sure. a traditional distributor what i'm saying is you should have the mindset that you're supposed to do everything you're supposed to do sure the reason we went with Gravitas is because they have a good relationship with iTunes and Netflix and they will make calls on your behalf. Mm. So we would, as we continue to get awards or have some great successes, we would call up our rep at Gravitas. We always answered on the second ring. I love it. And we would say, look, we've had this wonderful thing happen. And they would call iTunes. They would say, hey, you know, 
this has happened. Can we get a better placement? Can we get into the cover flow? Can we, you know, it's the New Year's. Can we maybe do a New Year's resolution package and have mile, mile and a half be in that? Like, and they were also willing to give us, you know, some diagnostics and some, you know, sort of dashboard stuff. Mm, That you won't get, you wouldn't get anywhere else. Yeah. I mean, I don't know where things are. Things change every day, but at that time, no. So so then they basically had a little bit more inside help than you would get with just putting it on the platform. Yes, I felt so. Okay. And that's also sometimes uh, for, and and to be fair, a lot of times with distributors, they'll do that with certain films that they feel that they're going to be able to make more money with. And they won't do that for all films because they can't. They can't call iTunes with 20 films, go, okay, today's film, I need you to do this. So they are kind of picky and choosy. So it it is kind of a almost, you know, they have to feel that they're going to be able to get a good ROI for pulling that favor. Does that make sense? Well, sure. But also it's a relationship, really. You know, it's, I am building a relationship. I'm keeping in touch. How are things going? Just saw you released the latest film. I really loved it. I just saw it on Netflix. It was really amazing. By the way, this is what we're up to. How are things going? You know, like it's a relationship. I get them invested, right? right? You have to have a huge why. Like, why is this important? And I share that why with everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, this is a really great movie. It's serving a community that's hungry for hiking documentaries. Look, they're out there because we're proving we have thousands and thousands of fans, you know? So <laughs> got them excited. So can you talk a little bit about sponsors? You said you had a couple of sponsors. How did you reach out to those sponsors and how did you leverage that audience again? Once I get like sponsors wasn't totally my world. That was much more on like Rick and Jen and those guys. Um, but I think, you know, Golden Road, they must have seen the doc. I can't really answer that. What I can say mm-hmm. is <laughs> sure, sure. so when we released when we released the the video for Kickstarter, the Kickstarter campaign. Mm-hmm. I think somebody knew it was her first day at REI Mm -hmm. and she, she was doing social media and, um, I think she put it on the REI Facebook page. She said, if we can get 5,000 likes in 24 hours, we'll donate $5,000 to this campaign. I don't think she ever thought she'd reach the goal. Well, they got 5,000 likes in six hours. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, REI is on board. Um, and, uh, then, then later on, they let us have some sort of uh, screenings, and we'd have the band play at local REI locations here in LA, where we would show the trailer, and then we would ask for money and support. Usually, we would do it in like their parking lot or something, or by the front door. It so, was fun. So, what I'm hearing again, a lot of, and I want to reiterate this to the audience, is that you're building relationships the through the entire process. Yeah. Every yes. day, every week, you're reaching out to people, and not just reaching out and asking for something. You're building. You're giving something. You're yes. giving. You're giving. And, you know, even t- to think of like bloggers, right? They need content, yes. right? You're the podcaster. You're like, what? Are we- I got to feed the, the hungry monster. I got to feed the beast. Uh, feed the yes, beast. exactly. So we're providing them like, hey, we'll write an article for you. We'll write a, if you want to write a blog for us, we'll put it on ours, vice versa. You know, here's an exclusive for you. Or Gravitas, they need good films and they need good films that's easy for them to sell. Of so course. I just show them it's going to be easy for you to sell this. Or REI, they always, you know, need to be part of something. Mm-hmm. So how about us? It's just, you, right? you, like, you, you make just, yourself shiny, a shiny object. <laughs> exactly. And, and that's the, how the snowball continued to go is I wanted to get to the point where like, I wanted to make ourselves so attractive that people would not say no. Mm-hmm. There would be, so, there would be no reason for anybody to say no, to get behind it. Right. Because I could say, look, first of all, the film's beautiful. The film is fun. Also, we have a huge audience. Plus we have all this, like we have this press kit, anything you possibly need. It's right here for you. Like we made it as easy as possible for people to get on board. So, yeah. <laughs> so, that, so you, so um, you got sponsors, you're building out relationships. And then you said you did a theatrical run, your own theatrical kind of tour. How did you we do did. that? We did. So, uh, we were able to identify where our fans were based on zip code. I think even when people signed up for a newsletter, we asked for their zip code. Mm-hmm. And, um, so that was extremely important. One, you need to know where people are. So we were able to identify locations, you know, sort of hot spots in the country where people would want to see the film. So one, we helped people, uh, do tug if they wanted to sort of sponsor a screening in their area. Plus we also four walled. We did a, um, 
a four wall tour where we just rented out the theater. And as long as we knew we would be able to cover our costs by selling merch, we mm-hmm. would do it. Mm-hmm. If, if And if we had the time, you know, it, it had to be break even. If it wasn't going to be break even, it was going to cost us, we wouldn't do it. So what, so on a business standpoint, uh, and uh, again, being devil's advocate, what's the point of breaking even on a, on a, on a theatrical experience? Um, other than just kind of like feeding that fan base. But if you're breaking even, what's the point on a business standpoint? Mm, okay. So, you know, something that I didn't talk about and that I talked with team very early on when I first came on the project, I'm like, what is the goal of this movie? Mm-hmm. Is it money? Mm-hmm. Is it prestige or is it exposure? Mm-hmm. Cause I pretty much feel like those are the, sure. you know, the main reasons. We decided it was exposure Mm. because they wanted to make other movies like this and they have. Mm. So it wasn't necessarily, they didn't want to go out of pocket because they were already out of pocket for the hike Mm -hmm. and the work that they were putting in. And it wasn't necessarily the prestige. We weren't going to go for like, you know, an Oscar or anything like that. You know, so it was, it was, it was really just so people got to know us as filmmakers, them as filmmakers, really supporting that vision. So it was just continuing to engage, get exposure. So as long as it was break even, then it was fine. That's a very great question that filmmakers need to ask themselves is what do you want out of this movie? What's what's your end goal? And that's a question that they don't ask. (laughs) Because if you know that answer, you can plot and market and set up and blueprint your way to that goal as opposed to just like, right. I'm just going to put it out. I'm like, well, <laughs> well, and also we would find that once we would, sh- once we would go to a town or a city and do a screening, then people would buy DVDs for their friends or then they would go on the website and they would, you know, they would get it again there or they would be on iTunes, whatever. Mm-hmm. And, um, the theatrical too, I'd love to get to the point where how we, I want to share iTunes. Yeah, that was my next question was iTunes. How, so how did you See, leverage you and iTunes? I we're, 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 we're in there. We're there. We're connected. <laughs> so, so then at a certain point, Gravitas said, here's your release date for iTunes, right? Uh, the subscription VOD is always first, mm-hmm. right? It's mm-hmm. the people that pay per viewing versus a Netflix, which is, and not the subscription, I'm just TV, calling TV, transactional. TV. Yeah, transactional. Mm-hmm. And so that was first. And they said, here's your date. We're going to, you always are on, well, at that time, I haven't looked at it recently, but at that time, you got to be on iTunes in a pre-sale mode for several weeks before you went into sale mode. Yeah, it's still the same, sure. Okay. So once we knew we were on the platform, we asked everybody, this is when we really snowballed it, we asked everybody that had ever come to a screening, Mm -hmm. bought a DVD, liked the music video, donated to the campaign, Go on iTunes and we're not telling you what to say, but will you just give us a star rating and a review? Mm -hmm. So by the time the movie launched, we had over 100 five-star reviews from the gate. Right. So the minute it went live, Mm -hmm. we immediately shot up to, I think our high water mark was number four. But did you get, you had a lot of pre-sales as well. Um, I'm sure there were some pre-sales there as well, but what it's not sales that shoots you up the ranking. It's the reviews. It's the star reviews at that time it was. Mm -hmm. Okay. So from day one, it's people's love of the film that made it more popular. Got it. Makes sense. And Gravitas called me up immediately. They're like, you've got to tell us what you did prestigious marketing and PR firm you've hired to do this campaign because it's brilliant. And I laughed. I'm like, it's just us. There's five of us. There's six of us doing this. Like we just leveraged our fan base and they couldn't get their head around it. Like no, I don't think just, so. traditional distributors don't, they're just, they just don't understand it. <laughs> no, 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 no. So then of course they were very excited to get us on Netflix. Right. And they were very excited to, and you know, they called up Netflix, look at how great this film is doing. Make sure you definitely give us, you know, 
okay. really good placement when it goes live there. And, you know, and what we had to do too, as filmmakers for our fans, we're like, look, there's many places you can get this film. If you get it on our website, great. That helps us. But mm-hmm. we also want to offer it on iTunes as well for you too. Okay. So we That's... tried to give people access to the film how in whatever way worked for them. And then also you have other revenue streams that you created from the film, like merch uh, and other areas. So it's not just one revenue stream, like I'm just going to do this. You've you've really branched out to a bunch of different things coming in for the film. Exactly. Exactly. So merch, you know, of course, from our distribution through Gravitas, mm-hmm. Film Option, um, Passion River, who we used for DVD. We got a, a little bit from them, sort of the bricks and mortars and the educational content. How, you, how much did, did you do? Was it a good, was it worth doing the DVD sales? The brick and mortar with yeah. them? Yeah, mm-hmm. it's just a general DVD sales. As, as far as in the pie of all the revenue coming in, I'm not asking specifics, but just like, it was it was it worth it? Mm, for us to sell our DVDs, yeah. yes, okay. yes. To sign with a distributor, you know, there are people that are still going out there to the bricks and mortar places and getting DVDs. You'd be surprised. There's mm-hmm. still our sales. Mm-hmm. But it's hard to find a DVD distributor that's willing to do DVD only. They want all rights. Everybody's so eager about all rights. Right. And I get it because they want to yeah. minimize their risk. Of course. And, um, but yet, not everybody's good at everything. So you can't do that. As a filmmaker, no. I'm not going to put all my eggs in one basket. Unless there's a nice big fat check up front. Yeah. But then you know what? They might just put it on a shelf and do nothing. And you don't have any control over that. Right. So there's, there's, yeah, there's a lot of pluses and minuses. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I, I, I have a hard time with sort of the distribution sales agents model especially for filmmakers that are just like, I'm done. I'm tired. I'm bored. I want to move on to my next project, Mm -hmm. you know, because nobody's going to love your baby like your baby. And nobody's going to be able to speak to your audience the way you can, Mm -hmm. you know, and while they might have good intentions, it's never going to match up to what your vision is. That's Mm -hmm. why you have to stay engaged. Filmmaking is all the way through distribution. I wish they they would teach that in in film schools. I wish they wouldn't just stop at post-production, the marketing, the social media, the crowdfunding, the crowdsourcing, um, everything, all of it, self-distribution, Facebook, social media, all of that is as important as the lenses that you're using. And and you've got to be thinking about all that day one and pre-production. You really do. Yeah. If you, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think some filmmakers, they're just in, in, in for the art Right. Or they don't know or they feel like selling's kind of dirty. Well, the thing is, if you're in for it for the art, then go make your five hundred dollar movies uh, or make a thousand dollar movies or make a movie that you can personally afford to, for the for the, the, the paint brushes to make your exactly. painting. But when you're playing with fifty, hundred, two hundred thousand dollars, that's an expensive paintbrush. And you have Very. to you have you have some responsibilities to recoup that money unless you're independently wealthy and you can do that. Which, of course. Which we've met these people. <laughs> well, but even then you're doing a disservice because you're not working your damnedest to try and get it out to the people that right. would love to know about it. Right. Exactly. exactly. Like you're expecting people to drive to Lancaster and just stumble across something that they love. And especially when there's so – it's not 1985 anymore. So it's so much content and so many options out there. I mean yeah. I remember working in, in a video store in high school uh, and I literally watched everything that came out because every week you. there was like – Three to five movies that would come out every week. That was it. And I would just watch those. Are you kidding me? How many are coming out daily? <laughs> There's Yeah. You're not enough time. And I and I watched all the TV shows. And you know, it's like and that it's, it's you just can't keep up now. No, um, I heard poor uh, Hugh Laurie's TV show on Hulu, Hulu just got canceled because nobody knew it was there. I know. I saw some. I saw some uh, posters for it around LA. I was like, that looks interesting. But I'm like, I just don't have the time. There's just too much other stuff to do and watch. Um, it's 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 absolutely crazy. Um, so can you tell me what the biggest mistake you see documentarians and for, and filmmakers make when they when they do their first film? From a crowdsourcing perspective. From any perspective. Oh, don't get me on that soapbox. Um, <laughs> That's what we're what here for. From a content perspective is I think we really need to get out of the talking hair, uh, talking heads model. 
you know, uh, I think talking head documentaries are just to, uh, we need to come up with something new. Mm -hmm. I'm getting tired of seeing it. I'm sure I'm not the only one. We just need Al Al Gore up there with a PowerPoint. We're good. (laughs) Well, at least give me a PowerPoint. I know, right? (laughs) At least we have Al Gore, who is easily one of the most charismatic people on the earth. (laughs) I know, I know, I know. So, you know, of course, you're always going to have somebody sitting in a chair and talking about something, but we really have to get sort of better about that. Um, And I think... You know, we've hit on a lot of them right now is like you have to think of your game, the end game at the very beginning. You have to be thinking long term. You have to think of it as a business. What I suggest for most filmmakers to do is do a crowdfunding campaign, even if you don't need the money for two reasons. Mm -hmm. One, most filmmakers don't do business plans. Mm -hmm. So doing a crowdfunding campaign makes you think of your project in a business plan mode. Mm -hmm. Who is my audience? Where do I find them? What do they want? How can I prove to them I'm serving them what they want? How is my content, you know, the quality that they're looking for, whatever. So the crowdfunding campaign forces filmmakers to think that way. Mm -hmm. And secondly, I think it's great marketing. Mm-hmm. It's really great marketing because you you have a call to action, you have a ticking clock, and you have something fun to talk about versus my movie's out now versus my movie's going to be out if you, you know, give me five bucks, it, it out, <laughs> right? Give, give me 20 bucks. I'll, 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 right, exactly. And that's really what we use for Inspired to Ride. I don't know if you want to talk about that at all, yeah. but we use crowdfunding in a really <laughs> unique way. So um, tell me, yeah, talk a little bit about Inspired to Ride, which is you kind of like taking the model from mile, mile and a half a little bit and put it into a similar kind of story, but different because it's a different you know, you're riding bikes as opposed to hiking, but you, you can, I can see where the, the uh, parallels are. Sure. Yeah, of course. The inspired to ride feature documentary, uh, it's still on Netflix. Mm-hmm. I believe you can check it out. It's the third in a trilogy of, um, uh, films about bike packing, which is a sport, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a crazy sport. It's kind of like a tour de France, but without doctors, without nutritionists, without hotel rooms, without, you know, chefs. And these riders ride across the country. In Inspired to Ride, it was across the United States from Oregon to Virginia. Mm-hmm. They don't, they're by themselves. And they are basically, they have a tent on their bike and they're stopping at Seven Eleven and McDonald's on the way. Mm-hmm. And the whole idea is like, how fast can you get there completely unsupported? There's wow. no prize money. There's no, it's just, like, they're just psychotic. Thing. Got it. They're psychotic. It's to be able to say like, we are crazy. We're badass, And it's for the bragging rights. So I'm going to go off topic for a second. Not off topic, but uh, did you ever see a, a, a series, a television series called the long way around? No. The Long Way Around is follows it's a documentary series. It was a limited series following Ewan McGregor and his, oh. and his best friend around. Uh, they get on motorbikes oh, and fun. they drive just the two of them and the DP, which is a third camera, you know, documenting this insane trip from Europe all the way to Los Angeles. Wow. But they drove. Oh, fun through and the, the, the it's so amazing i'll leave a link for it in the description for everyone who want to watch it i saw it and i just sat there watching it in awe because these guys were they just got a couple of bikes from bmw they got a sponsor of course because you one's in it and they just drove and and then they got stuff got stolen they're in like mongolia <laughs> they ran out of road so like <laughs> that's like, awesome. Like once you get Mag- Mon- uh, M- Mongolia, there's no roads. Like you like right. a little bit of paved road and then you're out then for you're like out. the country. So like and they're going through Russia and they go all the way up to the top. They they fly over to Alaska and then they drive down. So they're dealing with snow. I mean it was I'll insane. Have to check it out. insane. But it just reminded me of that right away. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Awesome. Very cool. So um, now you're doing so now with Inspired Ride, you're doing the same thing with VHX. Yes, exactly. So what's interesting is 
to come up with a game plan for Mile Mile and a Half, I actually copied the prior campaign for Ride the Divide, which is Mike Dion's first movie of this trilogy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, while I was doing Mile Mile and a Half, I called him up. I'm like, would you talk to me? And we did. We chatted. I basically took what he did for Ride the Divide because I had found out about him in a book called Selling Your Film Without Selling Your Soul by John Reese and mm-hmm. Sherry Handler. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Mike, I'm going to put steroids in what you did. He was like, go for it. And then he kept contacting me. He's like, I'm really impressed. I'm really impressed. Do you want to jump on Inspired to Ride? Which I did. And he's just, he's a, he's a documentary filmmaker. He, but he's also got this marketing brain that's genius. Mm-hmm. And I think he's actually coming up with a service right now to help filmmakers. Good. Um, Good. We need which it. is, is amazing. And yeah. You should probably talk to him as a matter mm-hmm. of fact, but he came up with this really great plan. He was like, he goes, my projects are turnkey now. I have my audience. I know all their email addresses. By the way, you want email addresses yes. for everybody. That's why you go through Tug and not Gather. Sorry, I love Gather. They're really great <laughs> people there. But email addresses are gold and they're your audience. You need to keep them. Yes, anyway, yes. Side rant over. So yes. Mike Dion, he was like, I know what my audience is, but let's come up with a fun way to sell tickets for the premiere. He goes, I just don't want to sell tickets. Let's make it look like it's a crowdfunding campaign. Mm-hmm. So we did a Kickstarter campaign. We knew we only wanted to raise $10,000. But if you have a ticking clock and a call to action, people get a lot more engaged. So that's what he did. It was so, super so, brilliant. So wait a minute. He had, the movie's done already. The movie was done. The movie had been finished and it was ready to be released. So then – He opened up a Kickstarter campaign to sell the movie. To sell the tickets to the premiere. That's ridiculous. Right? That's ridiculous. I know. That's why I love him. He's like a god. Ah." Um, So, but but what made it fun is, hey, we, it was kind of the call to action was like, we have an idea to do a fun premiere. Wouldn't it be great if it looked like this? And if you like that idea, then support this. And the idea was like, we are going to do panel discussions all day long about bike packing. We're going to show you the bikes. We're going to show you the gear. We're going to do interviews with all of the bike packers, the guys that actually did the race, the guys and gals yeah. that did the race. We are going to stream it live or you can come in person if you get a ticket. Buy your ticket now. Do you just want a ticket? Do you want a ticket and a t-shirt? Do you want a ticket, a t-shirt, a DVD? Do you want a ticket and a t-shirt and a poster? Do you want a ticket and a t-shirt, right. t-shirt and a poster and all the prior movies? Help make us make this the coolest premiere, all, you know, of all time. But if you don't believe in this kind of premiere, don't worry. We'll just offer it eventually. Uh-huh. Do, you, do you know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. And people are like, so it's fucking badass. And so we actually, I think we raised over ten grand for sure. Sure, and, and, and <laughs> that's actually brilliant. Uh, now, the one thing I've, I've noticed, and I've spoken to a lot of filmmakers about this, is. Uh, documentaries are a little bit of an easier sell because their audience mm-hmm. is so specific. But so easy some, to identify. It's mm-hmm. so easy to identify. But while narrative is a lot more difficult, a couple of guys that have done it right was um, Kung Fury. I don't know if you ever heard of that that short. No, Mm-mm. it was it was like an eight, like the most imagine the most ridiculous eighties uh, action. All the '80s stuff thrown into one movie, like the most ridiculous stuff in the '80s, and they threw it all with some Swedish uh, filmmaker. They raised one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars or something like that. Wow! Because um, they had dinosaurs and Thor, and and you know they were trying to kill Hitler, and they went back in time, and it was it was just brilliant. It was a short film; it's thirty minutes. Thirty minutes. They sold they and the kitchen sink, and they sold. Uh, albums like old school albums, uh, you know, LPs. They sold VHS, um, special edition versions, like because it was so like slick and cool. They've got like, but I mean, merch. can't you still? But you're able to identify who the audience is. That's what I'm you, saying. They you can were you can go. I know the people that would watch that. I know where to find them. I know what they like. I know what right. blogs they're listening to, or reading. I know where they are. I know who right. they are. So that's versus that like if you good- did a feature about like. Thanksgiving dinner with your family. You're like, done. That's, who's who's your nonprofit you're partnering with that's going to put you in their newsletter? Who's the sponsors? What like that's my, I don't know. That's my butterball. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my that's my point. Whereas that you know, Kung Fury as a, as a, as a case study makes perfect sense because that's a very small niche audience, um, yes. and they can identify him. But when when filmmakers go, I'm like, oh, I'm going to make a movie about you know, you know, friends getting together at college. Like 
how do you identify an audience for that? It's so difficult. So yeah. then that's when you get into more analytics with Facebook and you can go after similar movies and people who like those similar movies, but it's not nearly as powerful. It's not the same. It's and what you Mike do. D and I, it make, Mike Dion and I have conversations about this. We're like, how can we translate this to narrative? How can we take this really great system and make it work to the narrative story structure? Sure. And we haven't cracked the code. I'd love for somebody to figure it out. But once again, I think it's that it's what content are you creating for your niche market? Like, are you going to do your narrative feature about a woman, a woman that loves poodles and chocolate? Right. Like, and then you just go after those people. Right. And and also a lot of times that the product is not a feature, maybe it is a series, maybe it is a YouTube channel that you can monetize somehow. And there's many different ways to hit that market, but you never know what the audience wants. Right. Maybe you put the story inside a wrapper of chocolate and they have to keep buying more chocolate to get more story. <laughs> That's a genius idea. And you see, but there I is... don't know. Or maybe it's an augmented reality. And when you take your dog for a walk, you get like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's just like, but you figure out what is your, where's your audience? What are they liking? How do I serve them there? And how do they like to engage? You know, what are their stories? So now do you have any new projects coming up? I do have some fun projects coming up. One big one is, uh, it's actually an event Mm -hmm. that's focused around the entertainment industry and it's the conscious media think tank. I, I believe that as filmmakers, we have a responsibility to make the world a better place while entertaining it. And to me, that's conscious media, which is entertainment and media that creates awareness, but also has a positive impact. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole bunch of media psychology around why it's important and how our bodies and minds and emotions are affected by what we watch. Mm -hmm. And so I'm bringing together 64 of the top thinkers in the industry for a three day summit to figure out how do we increase the quality, quantity and accessibility of conscious media. That's awesome. That's awesome. I I can't wait. I'll put any information about that on, uh, in the post as well. When is that by the way, when is it? Uh, it's slated, uh, for March, 2018 funding raise dependent. <laughs> We're currently <laughs> in our fundraising, uh, mode. I have no doubt that you'll be, I'll be, you'll be fine. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we met at AFM because I was actually selling a sci-fi project. It's either yes. a trilogy or a TV show, yes. depending on what buyers want. We're still figuring that out now. So really excited about that. Awesome. And then I have a TV show about the frontier. So, so you're just a busy, busy gal. Mm-hmm. Now, gotcha. You got many plates spinning. You got to hustle. You got to hustle. Um, so I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my um, my guests. Uh, can you tell <laughs> Can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or career? Book. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Does it have to be a filmmaking book? No, of course not. Any book. Oh my gosh. The Power of Decision by Raymond Charles Barker. There it is. That's a good it was book. about getting your brain in the right place to put your to empower yourself. Very cool. All right. It's a, it's a bit more on the spiritual bent. For you know, I we don't we're not doing video here, but I have a huge library of every kind of you know book about film management or negotiating mm-hmm. or you know law. So I, I encourage people to continue to educate themselves. But I guess people that listen to podcasts already know that. <laughs> exactly. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Oh, I'm probably still learning it. Mm-hmm. It's probably this blind, a blind spot. It's just, it's where to focus your energy because mm-hmm. there's a million great things to be interested in mm-hmm. and you have to figure out what's your thing. Almost like what is your niche? Mm-hmm. Right. And, and just make sure that you're putting a little bit towards that every day. Great. You know, great advice. yeah. Now, what are three of your favorite films of all time? Ooh, Judo by Zhang Yimou. Okay. One of my favorites, uh, Steel Magnolias when you need a good ugly cry. Oh my God, it is an ugly cry with that movie. I haven't seen that movie since I was in the video store, but I remember it. That and that and Beaches came out at the same time. Oh, sure. I, you know, I have so many favorites. Um, I think always sort of a go-to would be like maybe Moulin Rouge. I love Moulin Rouge. I'm a big fan of Moulin Rouge and and uh, Romeo and Juliet. Oh, I meant to say Inspired to Ride, Mile, Mile and a Half, and Spiritual <laughs> Liberations are my favorite movies. I'm of joking. course, of course. Uh, yeah, I should have said besides your own, obviously. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Besides your own. Uh, and then where can people uh, find you online? 
Oh my gosh. Well, uh, my production company website is zazaproductions.com. That's Z-A-Z-A. Mm -hmm. The Conscious Media Visionaries <clears throat> about the think tank, <clears throat> excuse me, is mm -hmm. consciousmediavisionaries.com. And I'm mainly in Facebook and Twitter sometimes. I'm too busy. How, how do we how do we do all these social media platforms? I don't even know. Uh, so it's not easy, trust me. <laughs> I do it every day. It's a job. It's oh, a job, like everything else. It's like you gotta Yeah, feed when do we the get beast. to clone ourselves? Oh my when, god. When is the Japanese coming out with the clone? Can you we take over the world if it was just like three or four of me? My God, what I would do. <laughs> you would do awesome, Alex. <laughs> So cool. Kia, thank you so much for this very inspiring uh, conversation, and I hope it inspires yeah. filmmakers uh, listening to it because it's uh, it's proof, it's a blueprint to say, look, it's been done, it's been done multiple times, and uh, you took somebody else's blueprint and just yeah. built on it, and that's what yes. art is, and, and honestly, what you do in the marketing and distribution of a film and creating of a film is an art as much as the film is itself. Really is. Don't reinvent the wheel. Use somebody else's wheel and make it better. So, and, and like you had mentioned too, and I just want to let people know that the case study for Mile Line and a Half and all the details of what we did is in Arby's book. Yes, absolutely. And I'll put a link to all that in the show notes. Thanks again, Kia. I appreciate it. Sweet. Thanks, Alex. I had a best time. I want to thank Kia for coming on and just literally giving us the secret sauce on how she was able to be so successful with her film Mile, Mile and a Half. I learned a ton, as I always do by doing these episodes. You know, I, I do these guys... These, this show so much for you guys and get the information out for you. But I learn a ton from these episodes interviewing these amazing people that come on the show. So I'm very humbled and blessed that I have that opportunity and also that I can share all of this knowledge with you guys. If you want to go to the show notes and, and get all the links to everything we discussed in the episode, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 231. And by the way, guys, if any of you are going to be out at NAB tomorrow or the next day, I will be there. I'm going to be there from the 10th to 11th, and I'm going to be speaking at 11.45 on Wednesday at the Black Magic booth. We're going to be discussing all the things uh, that I've done with Black Magic, with the Da Vinci, shooting with the Ursa Mini, and also to talk a little bit about on the corner of Ego and Desire and how I shot that with the, uh, the pocket camera as well. So if you guys are out there, please come out. I love to talk to the tribe. I always like you know, actually talking to the tribe in real life and not a virtual conversation. So it's always great to meet you guys. So, and if you see me walking around, just stop me because I love to talk to you guys. Now I got to get ready for my flight tomorrow. So as always, keep that hustle going, keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.